Hello again. We are excited to be back with another COVID-19 literature update. My name is Eric Meyerowitz, and I'm the HIV Fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital, and my co-presenter is Aaron Richterman, the HIV Fellow at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, this is where we are in terms of COVID publications today. More than 2,500 peer-reviewed papers were archived to PubMed in just one week. We're very excited because there are some absolutely amazing studies that have come out over the last week, and we're looking forward to going through them in detail today. Here's our agenda for today. So we're gonna start with a remdesivir update, then we'll move on to transmission, then discuss theories to explain the illness severity spectrum, then we'll discuss a bit on vaccines and immunology, and we'll, look, uh, and, and we'll end with uh, looking at some important side effects of the pandemic. Of note, we're gonna post the time for each of these sections in the comments of the video so that you can skip ahead or skip around if you would like. We're gonna start with a brief review of the Adaptive COVID-19 Treatment Trial 1, or ACT-1, which was published on Friday, May 22nd in the New England Journal. Uh, this was the NIH-led trial of remdesivir versus placebo for hospitalized patients with COVID-19. We wanted to start with a timeline of the trial for context. The trial opened on February 21st. Um, the primary endpoint for the trial was initially defined as clinical status on an eight-point ordinal scale at day 15 for those in remdesivir versus control groups. This endpoint was changed on March 22nd uh, to time to recovery, and we're gonna dis discuss that further in a few minutes. Uh, the trial closed on April 19th, and on April 27th, the Data Safety and Monitoring Board met. Uh, this was actually supposed to be an interim analysis, but the trial had enrolled so quickly that all patients were enrolled uh, by that time, uh, although many had completed 28-day follow-ups. Uh, the DSMB recommended that the preliminary primary analysis and the mortality data be provided to the NIH study team. And the initial top line findings were released in a press release on April 29th. Um, on, uh, on May 22nd, the, the publication that we're discussing now was released, as we said, in the New England Journal. Uh, this is the ordinal scale used for the study. I've highlighted level five here since around 40% uh, uh, started there in each group. Uh, as we'll see in a bit, uh, level six and seven made up 20 to 30 percent uh, each uh, at baseline, and level four had around 10 percent. Um, around five percent had missing baseline ordinal scale uh, level. Uh, let's take a minute to review the primary outcome. The actual primary outcome for the trial is up here, and that was time to recovery. Uh, recovery was defined as the first day during the 28 days after enrollment where the patient was in categories one to three of that ordinal scale we just looked at, and I pasted those levels here. Uh, the original primary outcome, which became the, uh, the key secondary outcome, was this difference in clinical status between the two groups at day 15 after enrollment. Again, the difference was also defined using that eight-point ordinal scale that we saw on the last slide. We wanted to go back to discuss the change in the primary outcome since we think it is quite important. Uh, this change was recommended by the study statisticians and it was made as more information was being learned about the illness course of COVID-19. Uh, when the trial started on February 21st, uh, very few descriptive studies with information uh, of the illness course had been released. And I've got a summary of some of the major descriptive studies uh, released uh, or so, many of the early descriptive studies that were released. So February 21st is right in here. And really at that point, there had been very few studies as you can see that had come out. This study on February 7th was from, uh, was from Wuhan and published in JAMA. And they reported a median hospital uh, length of stay of around 10 days. As, addi as additional descriptive cohort studies were released in late February and March, it became clear that there was remarkable heterogeneity in the illness course and that some patients with severe disease could have a very protracted course. So in response to this information, the primary endpoint was changed. Importantly, it was not updated in response to data from the study, which was unavailable at the time the change was made. Knowing what we know now about the illness course, we think the change makes a lot of sense, and we think, we think that it was, it, was, it was done in good faith. This is a summary of the eligibility criteria for the trial. Uh, participants, participants had to be hospitalized with evidence of lower respiratory tract infection, and that was defined as, uh, one, as meeting one of the following criteria. So having radiographic infiltrates on an imaging study, 
having a peripheral, oxy uh, peripheral oxygen saturation of less than or equal to 94% on room air, requiring supplemental oxygen, or requiring invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO. This is an excerpt from the supplementary table S1 with some important baseline characteristics that we wanted to go through. As you can see, the average age in each group was just below 60. Uh, um, the median, uh, the median uh, days from symptom onset to randomization was nine in each group. So nearly 90% in each group had severe disease, uh, while around 10% had mild to moderate disease. Um, overall, the groups were distributed pretty evenly. We'll note, we'll note here in the in ord, baseline ordinal level five, there was slightly more in the remdesivir group, so 41% versus 38%. And then in the sickest group at the baseline, there was more in the placebo group, so 28.2% versus 23%. This is a simplified uh, uh, version of figure one. As you can, you, you can see that uh, 1,063 patients underwent randomization, 541 were, were assigned to receive remdesivir, and 522 assigned to receive uh, placebo. The vast majority received their assigned treatment. And you can see only a, um, only a, only a fraction received all 10 doses in, 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 either, uh, in either arm. Um, uh, 168 patients received less than 10 doses because they recovered, uh, although there's not enough information about how many doses these patients received. Nearly all the participants in either group uh, were included in the, in the analysis, although 132 in the remdesivir arm and 169 in the placebo arm had not experienced the primary outcome of clinical recovery or 28 days by the time of this initial analysis. Uh, this, is a, this is from figure two in the paper, and it shows the Kaplan-Meier curves for recovery. Uh, so the figure on the left here demonstrates the top-line finding. This is overall clinical, clinical recovery, and this is the top-line finding that remdesivir was better than placebo in terms of cl clinical recovery with an average of 11 days versus 15 days uh, time to recovery, 11 days for remdesivir, 15 for placebo, and a p-value of less than 0.001. The figure on the right shows the, re, uh, shows the recovery curves for the subgroup that started with a baseline ordinal score of five. And you can see that the curves, uh, the curves separate very clearly here. The median time to clinical recovery in this subset was seven days for remdesivir and nine days for placebo. And this had the highest rate recovery ratio of, uh, of 1.47. While the effect was strongest uh, in those with a baseline ordinal level of five, the effect was independent of baseline ordinal score. When they adjusted for baseline ordinal score, the results were very similar and remained significant. This is a very nice uh, figure from the supplementary appendix uh, that looks at clinical improvement based on the ordinal scale at day 15. Remember, this was the original primary outcome until it was changed on March 22nd. Uh, so the figure is stratified by uh, baseline ordinal score. So here you have a baseline ordinal score of five, uh, four, five, six, and seven. So least severe to most severe at baseline. And then the legend is, uh, is also according to, to ordinal score. So uh, one, through, one through eight. And what you can see is, is where, where everyone falls at, at day 15. So this was the baseline for this group, so four. And what you can see is there is a difference in th this, this amount here represents the difference in, in, uh, in, in the, the, the improvement in the remdesivir compared to placebo group. You can see that difference also here for an ordinal score of five. It maybe looks a little bit less here and then it's evaporated by the time you get to a baseline ordinal score of seven, which, which remember was uh, on mechanical ventilation or ECMO. Um, so what we'll see uh, in a minute, this, this, uh, this key secondary outcome uh, um, uh, was also significant. So, so uh, remdesivir was superior to placebo for this endpoint as well. So it met the, the actual primary outcome as well as the original primary outcome. The next major finding was regarding mortality. The mortality at 14 days was 7.1% for remdesivir and 11.9% for placebo with a hazard ratio uh, for death of 0 0.70 and a 95% confidence interval that passes one and goes from 0.47 to 1.04. Uh, 
So you can see the Kaplan-Meier curves for mortality here with the remdesivir treated group and its, um, and its confidence interval in blue and the, and the, uh, and the placebo treated group with its confidence interval in, in red. Um, this, this, this is from uh, the supplementary uh, figure three. So on the, far, on the far left, this is the curve for overall mortality. Um, and then in, in B in the center here, these are, this is what the curve look, looked like for those that started with the baseline ordinal scale of four. On the right, you can see uh, those that started with the baseline ordinal level of five. So there is a, there is a, a mortality benefit for this, uh, for this subgroup. So the hazard ratio for mortality was 0.22 for this group and was statistically significant with a 95% confidence interval from 0.08 to 0.58. Of note, uh, so here for those with a baseline ordinal scale of four, uh, so the hazard ratio for mortality was 0.46, but there was a wide confidence interval from 0 0.04 to 5.08, so, so, so not significant there. Uh, you can see the mortality curves for those with baseline ordinal scales of six here in D and seven here on, on the right uh, in E. Um, the effect uh, seen in the overall, and especially in those with lower baseline ordinal score, has evaporated again for, for these individuals. This is table two from the paper, again with, with, uh, with, with the key findings. And I've highlighted in the red box here, this is the primary outcome that remdesivir was uh, superior to placebo in terms of time to recovery, again of 11 compared to 15 days with a rate, uh, uh, with, with a rate ratio uh, uh, of, of, of 1.32. And in blue down here, we, you have that, that key secondary outcome, uh, uh, which was improvement on the ordinal scale at, at day 15. This is from the supplementary appendix as well, and this shows the distribution of adverse events between the groups. Um, so the placebo group had numerically more adverse events, as you can see up here. Uh, no deaths were considered re related to treatment with remdesivir. One important note is that there were nu numerically more aminotransferase um, uh, derangement in the placebo group con compared with the remdesivir group. This could be because there were more severely ill patients in this group. I remember there were, more, there were more with a baseline ordinal score of seven in that group. But it's also, it's quite reassuring because uh, remdesivir did not cause significant liver toxicity, which was a possible side effect of concern initially. And again, placebo is here, remdesivir is here, and these are the, the numbers with the percentages in, in, um, in, in parentheses for uh, the AST and then the ALT down here. Before we quickly summarize, I do want to take a minute to just highlight how remarkable this study was. It was an incredible feat of organization and collaboration in the middle of one of the hardest periods imaginable. It is a heroic effort. We're truly better off now than we were even a couple of months ago. Um, this is certainly a study we'll be teaching for the rest of our careers. The main findings of Act 1 are that remdesivir improves uh, time to recovery for hospitalized patients with COVID-19. The finding is independent of, uh, of uh, baseline clinical severity, but the data are strongest for non-ICU patients who required supplemental oxygen, which was the group that had the largest sample size. There is a numerical difference in, morta in mortality for remdesivir-treated arm uh, at 7.1% and the placebo-treated arm, um, arm at 11.9%, but this was not statistically significant. And finally, remdesivir was safe with similar side effects noted between the groups. Okay, so there have been a number of important analyses of transmission that have recently become available. And the first group of studies we wanted to talk about involve individual level transmission heterogeneity and the relative importance of super spreading events. Next slide. To start, I need to review some of the modeling uh, terminology we'll be using with these figures from an important report that was published by the Institute for Disease Modeling on May 20th. Now, when modeling the number of secondary transmissions from a case of COVID-19, the Poisson uh, distribution in which the mean is specified is one option. The mean in this case is the basic reproductive number, or the number of secondary infections per case in an entirely susceptible population. 
in the Poisson distribution, the mean is equal to the variance. And you end up with a distribution as shown in the right figure, which is an example using a basic reproductive number of 2.6. However, some infectious diseases display what is called overdispersion in the distribution of secondary cases, meaning that the variance in number of secondary transmissions is much higher than the mean. And this can't be accommodated by Poisson, by the Poisson. Overdispersion is illustrated in the schematic on the left, showing a branching process of secondary infections, where the initial generation leads to two infections, and one of these two infections leads to zero secondary infections, and the other leads to eight. Rather than the Poisson, a negative binomial distribution is much better at estimating these scenarios because it also includes a dispersion parameter, also called K, uh, which allows for variability in the variance. Uh, as K gets larger, the negative binomial distribution approaches the Poisson distribution. But when K is very small, the model displays over dispersion, leading to the distribution seen in the center figure, whereby the vast majority of cases lead to very few secondary infections. And there is a long tail of a few cases giving rise to many secondary infections in what are referred to as super spreading events. Next slide. Now let's take a look back at an early evaluation of transmission heterogeneity in this preprint that was posted in mid-April by a group from the Center for the Mathematical Modeling of Infectious Diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Health. Um, based on evidence from SARS and MERS showing that not all people with these infections cause a secondary transmission, they hypothesized the same might be true for COVID-2, especially given the fact that there had been countries with a number of imported cases of SARS-CoV-2, but fewer secondary cases than might be expected. So they used a modeling approach to construct the likelihood of observing the reported number of imported and local cases of COVID-19 for each country, assuming that the distribution of the number of secondary transmissions were identically and independently distributed, and then used this likelihood function to estimate the dispersion parameter of a negative binomial distribution as we discussed in the last slide. Again, the dispersion parameter can be thought of as an estimate of individual level transmission heterogeneity. Now in the figure on the left, you can see their estimates for the dispersion parameter on the y-axis based on uh, various assumed basic reproductive numbers on the x-axis, with the red area being the general consensus range for SARS-CoV-2. They found a 95% credibility interval for the dispersion parameter uh, of 0.04 to 0.2, with these estimates that are much lower than one, uh, suggesting presence of a high amount of heterogeneity in transmission. The consequences of this suggested heterogeneity are uh, in the figure on the top right, uh, where this basically uh, suggests that they found that around 10% of cases lead to about 80% of secondary transmissions. This is further illustrated by the figure on the bottom right, showing the heavily skewed right distribution, uh, heavily skewed right distribution of the number of secondary cases on the x-axis with the probability on the y-axis. So you can see that zero secondary cases has a probability of about over 0.7. So this analysis was one of the first to suggest the importance of super spreading events uh, in SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. We've now seen a number of cluster investigations that further raise suspicion for super spreading events. So we spoke last month uh, about the outbreak in the Korean call center highlighted in the schematic on the top left, whereby 94 cases were linked to a single area and a single floor of an 11 story call center. In the last couple of weeks, we have seen more clusters like this. In the bottom left, in a report that was published in Emerging Infectious Diseases on May 20th, a wedding outbreak is described, whereby 76 of 350 wedding attendees developed COVID-19 and one died, with the index patient thought to be the bride's father. In the top right figure, you can see represented a church outbreak in Arkansas, uh, details of which were published in MMWR on May 19th, during which two symptomatic people attended church over the span of three days, uh, and 35 of 92 attendees uh, acquired COVID-19, including three people who subsequently died. Lastly, in the bottom right, also published in MMWR on May 19th, are details from the now infamous choir practice, during which one symptomatic person is thought to have led to 52 likely infections, or 87% of the group, with two subsequent deaths. Next slide. Now, I want to take a minute, uh, a few minutes, to discuss a truly fascinating report from probably the most detailed uh, hospital outbreak investigation we have seen to date. I'm going to highlight just a few aspects, but the entire report is incredibly enlightening and worth reading in its entirety. I've included the link uh, down below. 
Um, this investigation was done at St. Augustine's Hospital in Durban, South Africa. Uh, and this hospital has 18 wards and six ICUs, uh, and it employs 735 clinical staff. This investigation took place in April and May in the midst of a substantial outbreak of COVID-19, as indicated on this epidemiologic, uh, epidemiological curve, which shows the date of diagnosis on the x-axis, uh, with 39 patients and 80 staff members eventually confirmed to have COVID-19. 15 of the 39 patients with COVID-19 have died uh, as of uh, the date of this report. And as you can see uh, on the red dots on the curve, uh, the first three cases were seen in the emergency department. Two of these uh, had recently returned from Europe and the other worked frequently with international travelers. Their first inpatient case was this person uh, diagnosed on March 22nd, uh, who was a woman initially admitted on March 9th with stroke-like symptoms, uh, spent time on the medical ward and in an intensive care unit, and was eventually discharged to an elder home on March 16th. She was readmitted six days later with respiratory failure and ultimately uh, had positive testing by endotracheal aspirate for SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. The investigation team put together this timeline of the 34 patient cases along with which ward they were in, uh, indicated by the color in the figure, uh, the symptom onset uh, indicated by the star, and uh, positive PCR indicated by the dot. You can see the initial three emergency department cases in green at the top, patients 1, 2, and 18. One thing the authors highlight is the sheer amount of movement from one ward to another. Many of these patients uh, did during their stay. Some of this, actually, they point out, was actually because of clearing out wards to be used for COVID-19 or for COVID-19 trainings. Next slide. They used this timeline to generate a hypothesis of how the virus spreads throughout the facility and also to an outside nursing home, uh, as indicated on the bottom, uh, and a dialysis unit, as indicated on the right. As we'll get to in a minute, they believe the infection was introduced by patient one in the emergency department on May 9th, before being introduced into the hospital by patient three uh, and spreading in six major waves involving five different hospital wards, starting with medical ward one, uh, the neurology ward, the medical ICU, a second wave in medical ward one, the surgical ICU, and surgical ward one. Next slide. So the investigation team noticed that the first outpatient case, patient one, as well as the person who would become the first inpatient case, patient three, were both in the emergency department uh, on March 9th during overlapping times. As shown in the schematic, patient one uh, presented with respiratory symptoms to the screening area uh, and was brought back to the triage station. Patient three later arrived with stroke-like symptoms and was placed directly across from this triage area, immediately adjacent to where patient one would, uh, would have to go to later leave the emergency department. Next slide. Patient three was admitted to the cardiac intensive care unit that evening and stayed four nights before being transferred to medical ward one from March 13th to March 16th before being discharged to an elder home. She was febrile on March 13th, but reportedly had no other symptoms. The first confirmed staff case was a female nurse uh, working with this patient in the cardiac ICU who was diagnosed on March 17th. The investigation team details each ward's chain of transmission, but as an example, here is the first chain in medical ward one. The timeline of each patient is on the left, and you can see uh, when patient three arrived on the day of symptom onset to bed 12A, indicated uh, both in the map and uh, on the timeline in red. Five other patients in the ward at the same time were eventually diagnosed with COVID-19, indicated in green on the floor map, including the person across from patient three and four patients in a single room down the hall. Next slide. I won't go through these in detail, but you can see how they documented each additional chain of transmission as patients with infection were brought from one ward to the other. As far as I can tell from the report, none of these wards were officially designated to care for patients with COVID-19, and there was not a universal uh, masking policy in place. But again, just a truly remarkable investigation, and I highly recommend taking some time to review it in full. Next slide. As far as healthcare workers, you can see where uh, here where nurses who were diagnosed have been working. There was a very close correlation between the sites where intense transmission occurred among patients and where healthcare worker infections were observed. Interestingly, the authors of the report postulate that there was a substantial amount of transmission through indirect contact and fomites through, for example, stethoscopes, given the fact that patients in different areas of wars were being infected. However, you know, given the likely greater importance in general of droplet transmission and the high rates of healthcare worker infections, you know, we do wonder if asymptomatic or symptomatically infected healthcare workers making their way around the wards may have instead contributed to the distribution of COVID-19 within the specific wards. 
The authors also do not comment specifically on the ventilation of the building, which we know to be an important factor in transmission, although typically in healthcare settings with large burdens of endemic uh, tuberculosis, uh, ventilation is emphasized. The authors also note that no healthcare workers infect, uh, work, worker infections were detected from the COVID-specific unit, uh, highlighting to us that when infectious risk is recognized and proper PPE is implemented, there's actually quite low risk to healthcare workers. We'll come back to this topic in a moment. Uh, next slide. As the icing on the cake of this investigation, they did a phylogenetic analysis of 18 samples, including eight, eight inpatients, one nursing home resident, and nine healthcare workers, highlighted in the red box. All 18 sequences were clustered closely together, with greater than 99.99% sequence homology indicating a closely related series of transmission chains. As a control, they compared these sequences to other local sequences, uh, which did not cluster with these isolates, again suggesting that a single unique introduction to the hospital was most likely to have been responsible for this super spreading event. Next slide. Now, as a small side note, thinking about transmissions in healthcare workers, we have two nice studies that were published in JAMA Open uh, on May 21st. The first is a single center series in Wuhan, a data collected from January 1st to February 9th and is shown in the upper right figure. Events are indicated along with dates uh, on the x-axis. Uh, the light blue bars are non-frontline health workers and the dark blue are frontline health workers. They found a total of 110 out of over 9,500 healthcare workers who tested positive. Importantly, PPE practices improved dramatically in late January and 60% of all infections were before this time. After January 20th, there was only one frontline worker who became infected compared to 24 non-frontline workers, providing indirect evidence that the PPE protocols in place for those with higher risk jobs were protective. The second study corresponds to the figure below. It was a cross-sectional study performed in two teaching hospitals in the Netherlands. They tested all healthcare workers with symptoms, screening uh, just over 1,300 out of uh, greater than 9,500 employed healthcare workers or 14% of the total force. Of those uh, 1,353, 86 tested positive, representing 1% of all employed. Importantly, only three of these 86 reported having been exposed to an inpatient with a known diagnosis of COVID-19 before onset of symptoms. Again, further evidence that despite all the hype about various experimental studies, PPE works to prevent transmission. We've also provided a few earlier references below as well, highlighting the simple fact that PPE works. Next slide. Okay, so back to transmission heterogeneity. This preprint posted on May 21st used information from all detailed contact tracing investigations in Hong Kong to describe clusters of infection uh, and estimate the variance in transmissibility. The authors found that over half of the 1,038 infections in Hong Kong as of the time of this report were associated with at least one of 135 known clusters with a median size of two and the largest cluster involving 106 cases. After excluding clusters involving only one imported case, they were left with 53 clusters, within which 75% of cases could be linked, leading to documented transmissions. Uh, uh, so you can see on the figure on the left, um, the uh, proportion of transmitters with various numbers of uh, documented tr tr transmissions by proportion there. As you'll recall, this distribution closely resembles the negative binomial distribution with overdispersion and the long right tail. They estimated the dispersion parameter to be 0 0.37, indicating that approximately 20% of infections went on to cause 80% of the transmission events. The right figure shows the identified clusters, with the largest one on the left being what they're calling the bar and band cluster, which is associated with 106 cases, accounting for over 10% of all cases in Hong Kong and 30% of those locally acquired. In the middle on the top is a wedding, and the one on the bottom in the middle was a religious event. The remainder of the clusters can be seen on the right. Uh, next slide. So in another study, these investigators in Israel used viral genomic epidemiology to look at the same concept in this preprint posted to MedArchive on May 22nd. By sequencing 212 SARS-CoV-2 genomes from random samples across Israel, they were able to use phylogeny of these samples as compared to 4,693 representative sequences from around the world to better understand the introduc introductions of the virus into the country, the spread within the country, and to estimate transmission dynamics. As shown in the phylogeny in the top left, uh, with blue dots representing samples taken in Israel uh, and represented uh, on the map in the middle, they found multiple initial introductions into Israel from across the world, but predominantly from the US and Europe. 
As the pandemic spread, entry into Israel was restricted, and they found that local transmission became dominant. To estimate transmission dynamics, they then performed a phylodynamic analysis using the viral sequences uh, in the context of a susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, compartmental model. They used a model that, that specifically incorporated transmission uh, heterogeneity and allowed them to evaluate a range of transmission heterogeneities by, specif by specifying a parameter called P sub H, which is the proportion of infections that lead to 80% of the transmissions, as we've been talking about. Uh, in the last few slides. Uh, the figure on the bottom right shows some of the results from this phylodynamic analysis, with the x-axis showing date uh, and the y-axis showing cumulative incidence of infection. The black dots represent the actual reported cases in Israel over time, and the three colored lines show their phylodynamic uh, model output at various uh, P sub H's, with the blue being 0.01 or 1%, pink being 0.05 or 5%, and green being 0.1 or 10%. Assuming almost complete case reporting by the end of the period, their analysis suggests that between 5 and 9% of infections led to 80% of secondary infections, as shown by the intersection of the actual cases reported and their model output uh, as the epidemic leveled off. Next slide. Now let's return to the report from the Institute for Disease Modeling that discusses the implications of these findings. They use the figures I've shown here to illustrate the distinct features of an outbreak characterized by overdispersion as seems to be the case for SARS-CoV-2. Let me first briefly uh, walk you through what we were looking at, and then we can discuss these implications. So the top row of figures show simulations using a negative binomial distribution with a dispersion parameter of 0.16. And the bottom row of figures show simulations using a Poisson distribution. Both include a basic reproductive number of 2.6. Each uh, vertical panel assumes a different crowd size, increasing from left uh, to right. The x-axis on each uh, figure is the cumulative outbreak size after six generations of transmission, and the y-axis is the percent of simulations with that particular outbreak size, and is displayed on the log scale. In initial populations of 100 or more, they find that 63% of outbreaks have no secondary transmissions in the, in the overdispersed models, highlighted with the pink bars, and that 77% of outbreaks have less than 10 total infections and do not establish ongoing transmission. This is substantially different than the Poisson models, where for populations of 100 or more, uh, only 7% of outbreaks have no secondary transmissions, and only 11% have less than 10 total infections. As a result, um, as I've highlighted below, in infectious diseases that display over dispersion and secondary transmission, uh, there are four important consequences highlighted by these authors. First, that there is a relatively lower likelihood of an outbreak being established after a given introduction. Second, if the outbreak does take hold and moves beyond a few super spreading events, the dynamics begin to show stable exponential growth, appearing similar to a Poisson distribution. Third, if an outbreak does take off, it will appear more explosive in the first few generations when super spreading events will generate the vast majority of secondary infections. And fourth, a continuous series of super spreading events is necessary to establish exponential growth, and if eliminated, can effectively control the outbreak. Next slide. So in terms of mechanisms of super spreading events, the authors of this report highlight several. The first is biological, characterized by something specific causing a higher probability of transmitting per contact. In the context of SARS-CoV-2, this seems to most co uh, closely correlate with the timing around symptom onset uh, and potentially viral load at that time. The second mechanism is behavioral uh, and social, whereby certain individuals have a much higher number of contacts uh, with susceptible people. Uh, the third mechanism involves high-risk facilities, like healthcare, meatpacking plants, prisons, work dormitories, nursing homes, et cetera. The intrinsic nature of these facilities place individuals at high risk of acquisition and transmission. These facilities can fuel larger regional outbreaks by seeding continuously new transmission chains. The fourth mechanism involves opportunistic in scenarios where large numbers of people gather with normal risk of transmission, like a wedding, or probability of transmission is temporarily increased, like singing in a choir practice. The authors of this report go on to suggest that early evidence points to super spreading events of SARS-CoV-2 occurring predominantly in closed environments with poor ventilation, crowded spaces, and with long durations of exposure. In this context, the authors go on to describe the most imp the, 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 the important implications of reducing uh, super spreading events in the context of an outbreak with high transmission heterogeneity in what they call cutting or trimming the, the uh, long tail of secondary transmissions. 
So in the figure in the top right, you can see that assuming a basic reproductive number of three, uh, that if we assume that larger numbers of secondary cases are removed, as seen on the x-axis at various cutoff points, um, with, uh, with efficiency rates, uh, as shown on the y-axis, that the effective reproductive uh, uh, rate will be substantially reduced as indicated by the colors. So for example, you know, uh, if we use a cutoff number of 20 secondary cases uh, at an efficiency of 70%, that reduces the effective uh, reproductive number from three to two. Uh, similarly, in the figure on the bottom, you can see the percent of outbreaks that will be successful uh, at varying basic reproductive numbers and assuming a Poisson distribution on top, a negative binomial distribution, and then a negative binomial distribution, except excluding secondary infections of 10 or more with 100% efficiency. Next slide. So if transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is really as heterogeneous as this growing evidence base suggests, it will then be essential for us to continue identifying characteristics of superspreading events. To this end, this group from the Center for Mathematical Modeling of Infectious Diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine performed a systematic review of SARS-CoV-2 clusters and have begun maintaining a database uh, that I've linked below. They found in particular that religious venues, worker dormitories, elder homes, hospitals, and cruise ships were associated with a large number of eventual cases with clusters also associated with schools, bars, shops, and conferences. We look forward to learning a lot more about this issue, uh, as well as potential ways to mitigate these events uh, in the coming days. Next slide. So now let's move on to talk about some other updates in transmission. Next slide. The Korean CDC released an important report on May, 5th, May 19th uh, of findings from an epidemiological investigation prompted by concerns of case cases testing positive for SARS-CoV-2 after being discharged from isolation. And they looked at 285 such cases, terming them, quote, repositive cases. Repeat testing was prompted 38% of the time by symptoms, 60% of the time by an investigation, and 3% of the time by request of the patient. 48% of these repositive cases had symptoms present at the time of testing. You can see on the histogram on the left, the amount of time from discharge to the positive test ranging from one to 37 days. And the time from symptom onset to the test was between seven and 82 days. There were two important findings in this report. First, of 108 samples that they tested for viral culture, zero were positive, providing further evidence that these late positive PCRs do not correlate with replication competent virus. Second, 790 case, uh, contacts were traced for these repositive cases and followed for a minimum of 14 days, during which only three were newly confirmed to have COVID-19. All three of these had known contacts with other people who were more likely to have transmitted the virus. Next slide. Additionally, this study published in CID on May 22nd provides another wrinkle to interpreting late PCR results. They looked retrospectively at 90 PCR positive samples ranging from the day of symptom onset to 21 days after symptoms began. They performed viral culture on all specimens and found that, that 26 of them, or 29% of the total, demonstrated viral growth. As we've seen in the Wolfel Nature paper and as supported by the Korean CDC data we just discussed, they found no positive cultures after seven days post-symptom onset. This is shown in the figure in the pink bars with the x-axis is time from symptoms to test and the right y-axis uh, showing the probability of culture positivity. They also looked at the relationship between the cycle threshold value of the PCR reaction, meaning the number of cycles required for the PCR to become positive and the likelihood of a positive culture. The cycle threshold can be thought of as a semi-quantitative estimate of viral load, with higher cycle thresholds uh, representing a lower viral load. Uh, you can see the cycle thresholds represented in the figure by the light blue dots uh, and on the left y-axis. They found no positive viral cultures in samples that had a cycle threshold value greater than 24. They also did a multivariable logistic regression that included cycle threshold value, time from symptom onset to test, age, and gender, and found that both increasing cycle threshold and greater time from symptom onset to PCR were independently associated with a negative viral culture. This provides further evidence that there is little to no replication competent virus present after around day seven after symptom onset, and also provides a way to use the cycle threshold value of the PCR test as an additional estimate of transmission risk. Next slide. This then is, a, is basically a slightly modified summary slide of a suggestion from our last talk that these studies further support. So given, support, uh, given evidence in support of these three statements at the top, first, that viral RNA does not seem to correlate with replication competent virus after day eight, 
Second, that transmissions after five days of symptoms have not been documented and are likely to be rare. And third, the prolonged and intermittent viral shedding is frequently seen in both mild and severe cases. PCR testing later in disease for clearance of transmission-based precautions is unlikely to be helpful and probably delays care, causes stress, and even creates these false narratives of reinfections. We've also added the question mark here about the role of cycle threshold value in some select cases, but in general feel that either a symptom or time-based strategy for clearance of precautions is most reasonable. Next slide. So then to summarize this long section uh, on transmission updates, first, modeling, cluster investigations, and phylogenetic studies have all suggested a high amount of transmission heterogeneity for SARS-CoV-2 with an implied importance of superspreading events with the implication being that cutting the tail uh, interventions will be important for epidemic control. Second, we highlighted additional data that late PCR positivity is not meaningful and that in general, testing-based strategies for clearance and uh, clearance of transmission-based precautions should be done away with. Finally, PPE works, but not said. Next slide. Okay, so uh, it's become clear that there is uh, marked heterogeneity uh, in the presentation of uh, COVID-19, and we're going to go through some of the different uh, some of the different theories that are out there and the evidence for them to to explain this. Um, so there are certainly some individuals who are truly asymptomatic with SARS-CoV-2 infection, and the the actual uh, percentage of those is still unknown. The majority of those who experience clinical symptoms, uh, around 80% or so will have a self-resolving viral illness. And this can include cough, fever, myalgias, change in smell or taste, uh, with gastrointestinal symptoms thought to be a bit less common. Um, around 15% develop severe disease. This typically requires hospitalization and is often marked by hypoxemia. And around 5% experience critical illness, some requiring mechanical ventilation. The reasons for this spectrum remain unclear, but we're going to go through, as I said, the evidence for, uh, for, for, for the different theories that are out there. So in general, there are thought to be host factors, societal factors, and viral factors that may contribute to, the heter to, to this heterogeneity. And there's accumulating evidence for, uh, for each of these. Uh, so we're going to start by going through some of the host and societal factors. Um, the list uh, that we're going to go through is uh, is on this slide, and and um, so let's start with comorbidities. And so in our first two literature updates, we reviewed some of the early large descriptive cohort studies. Uh, these showed that increasing age and a variety of medical comorbidities were associated with severe COVID-19. Most of the findings in those early studies have have um, have been replicated in, in other studies. Uh, recently, a large UK cohort study uh, analyzed the features of more than 20,000 patients uh, who'd been hospitalized there with COVID-19. They reported a median age of 73 among their hospitalized patients and a median duration of symptoms of around four days prior to admission. 67% of their hospitalized cohort had at least one, comorbi one comorbidity the most frequent comorbidities were cardiac disease with 31%, diabetes with 21%. And, and, and at the time of reporting, 41% had been discharged alive, 26% had, die, had died, and 34% were continuing to receive care with, in, in the hospital setting. Here, what you can see in this figure is their hazard model for death. So increasing age um, was, was, uh, was, 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 associated with, uh, with, with mortality. And so the hazard ratio for death for an age over 80 was actually greater than 11. Female sex was protective. And then the multiple other comorbidities are here with many of them uh, showing significance with, with, uh, with, uh, with, with p-values on the, on the right here. Another important cohort study uh, came from hospitals uh, in New York City. It included uh, uh, 5,279 patients diagnosed with COVID-19, including 2,741, or 51.9% who were hospitalized. Nearly a quarter of those hospitalized required mechanical ventilation. They calculated risk factors for hospital admission as well as for, as well as for mortality. And this table includes excerpts from their competing risk model for mortality. Age, again, had the, had the strongest um, association with, with mortality. Uh, male sex, uh, heart failure, and cancer were also significant, as you can see here. 
Societal factors too are clearly extremely important in terms of, in terms of outcomes. And these are uh, some of the most important studies that have been reported so far uh, demonstrating the strong associations between race and poverty for worse outcomes with COVID-19. This is critically important. This is a critically important area and we're gonna be following it closely. It must be understood so that changes can be made urgently. In our earlier updates, we included a slide with risk factors for severe disease. We've updated that slide here, including everything we've just spoke about. Um, these, are, uh, these are what are currently accepted as the major epidemiologic and demographic risk factors for severe disease. So uh, differential ACE2 expression is another really interesting theory that may help explain the, uh, the differential severity and mortality seen in COVID-19. In a fascinating research letter published in JAMA on May 20th, scientists at Mount Sinai in New York City analyzed nasal epithelial samples of 305 individuals ages 4 to 60. These samples had been collected uh, previously for research related to asthma, and, it, and they included individuals with and without uh, asthma. They found an age-dependent ACE2 expression in the nasal epithelium, as you can see plotted in the figure here on the left. Uh, so there's a truly excellent accompanying editorial uh, and with a citation also on this slide, which we, which we, which we recommend highly. Um, as, as noted, uh, this, does, uh, th this study does not yet show differential ACE2 expression in the lower respiratory tract, so we have to interpret with a little bit of caution, but, but it is quite, quite a, provo a provocative finding. On the left, you'll see, a fi uh, sorry, on, on the right here, you'll see a figure from uh, a study published in the American Journal of Physiology on May 20th. They showed that normal human bronchial epithelial cell lines that were treated with estrogen had lower ACE2 expression than those treated with the control solution. So the estrogen treated cells are represented by the white bar and the control treated cells with the, with the gray bar. And you can see the difference in ACE2 expression here. This is intriguing since it could at least partially explain the difference in severity for men and women. Human leukocyte antigen or HLA alleles are essential for host ability to present viral antigens, which is a key step in the successful adaptive immune response. Certain HLA alleles allow for more robust presentation of specific viral proteins, and others may have more difficulty with presentation of specific viral proteins. So in this very interesting study, uh, authors uh, performed a computer modeling analysis of SARS-CoV-2 peptide presentation across the entire viral proteome uh, for 145 different HLA types. They predict which HLA types would most easily, uh, would most, would most easily prevent the SARS-CoV-2 epitopes. So what you can see here are the distribution of HLA alleles, uh, and, and here is the global allele frequency in, uh, in in humans, and then for each, there is a plot here with how easy, uh, with, 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 with how well they can present SARS-CoV-2 epitopes with the best, uh, the, the best presenters up here and the worst presenters down here. Uh, and you can see, obviously, there is quite a range here. On the, on the right, you can see their uh, specific graphs for the, for the best three uh, presenters and the worst three presenters. So best three here on the, on the left here and the worst three all the way on the right. Um, one interesting note is that, uh, is that HLA B4601, they predict to have very poor ability to present, to prevent, uh, to present SARS-CoV-2 epitopes. This is, a, this is very interesting because this allele was associated with more severe SARS. Uh, there, have not been an, there have not been enough large HLA studies in individuals with COVID-19 yet, but we expect there to be more information about this moving forward. And, and hopefully some of those large, uh, uh, those large descriptive studies might, might give us a sense of, of, uh, of whether there is, there's, uh, there's an HLA, uh, uh, HLA uh, risk for, for severity. Another host factor that's been in the news and that may be associated with, the disease, with disease severity is ABO blood group. So in a very interesting letter published in the British Journal of Hematology on May 7th, authors reported that individuals with blood group A were overrepresented among those who were hospitalized with COVID-19 and those with blood group O were underrepresented. So what they first did was they analyzed 265 patients at a hospital in Wuhan 
and they compared them to 3,694 controls in the, in the area. And what they found was among their hospitalized cohort, 39.3% had blood group A, whereas in the general population, uh, blood group A was only about 32.3%. And they found the opposite for blood group O. So in the general population, blood group O is about 33.8%, but in their hospitalized patients, it was only 25.7%. So then they went to a larger sample and they looked at, three, at, uh, at ABO types from three different hospitals among, and compared to the same control group. Um, and what you can see is among these now more than 2,000 patients, they basically had very similar findings. So an overrepresentation of blood group A among their severe hospitalized patients and, 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 a, um, and a, a, a relatively less uh, amount of, of blood group O among the hospitalized cohort. Um, they, they also report that blood group O uh, was, was uh, found, uh, that, 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 that people with blood group O were found to be less likely to become infected with SARS. Um, in a response in the same journal uh, from O'Sullivan and colleagues with the citation also at the bottom of this slide, uh, these authors note that blood group O is associated with less thrombosis risk, and they wonder if the association with thrombosis and severe COVID-19 um, and, and, and whether there's something about the same mechanism where, where blood group O is, is protective against, uh, you know, for, for these patients for not having severe disease. They also note that individuals with blood group O are less susceptible to developing cerebral malaria, which is also marked by microvascular, microvascular occlusion. This is certainly something to keep an eye on. Um, a very exciting theory about differential severity is baseline cross immunity, possibly from exposure to other common human coronaviruses. We've discussed both of these studies in the, in the past, so we'll go through them quickly here, um, but briefly, both of these groups showed that a significant proportion of healthy donors had reactive T cells to SARS-CoV-2 proteins. So the study published from Cell showed that about 50% of their historical donors fell into this category. So you can see that uh, all the way here on the right side, uh, where they're looking at uh, th this, on the y-axis is, 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 uh, is a marker for, for T cell reactivity and uh, they're looking at for reactivity to spike proteins, non-spike proteins, or overall uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Blue, in blue are patients uh, who, are, who have recovered from COVID-19, and black are, are unexposed. And as you can see, there's a significant, there's a significant proportion of unexposed patients who, who have, uh, who have re uh, reactive, reactive T cells. Um, the figure in the middle is from a preprint that showed 34% of healthy donors had reactive T cells to the S protein of SARS-CoV-2. These were more likely to be reactive to the S2, uh, to, to the S2 part. So again, here in the middle, you can see healthy donors in the gray bar, COVID uh, patients who recovered from COVID-19 in the black, and this is, this is the percent that have, that have, um, that have uh, reactive T cells. Again, more likely to be in the in the C-terminal part or of, of S2. What they point out here is that the C-terminal part of S2 is the part with the most sequence similarity to the four uh, common circulating uh, human coronaviruses. And that's what you can see here, where each, where each bar is, is representative of, of one of those viruses. And a, and a higher bar increases, a, a higher bar indicates more similarity with SARS-CoV-2 epitopes uh, from the same area. Again, C-terminal, uh, being more similar to SARS-CoV-2 than the N-terminal part. So there are, of course, still many open questions about this. For instance, it's not been shown that, these, that individuals with baseline reactive T cells to SARS-CoV-2 have a less severe disease course compared with those without such cells. That would be an important study, and it's one that we hope is, is, is underway. Viral factors may also affect disease course, and some uh, are hypothesized to include the particular strain of the virus, and the amount of virus or inoculum, as well as the site of exposure. And we're gonna discuss what's known about this next. Multiple studies have cataloged the genetic divergence of SARS-CoV-2 in different geographic locations. As with all RNA viruses, SARS-CoV-2 has a certain error rate with each replication cycle. Over, the virus, uh, over time, the virus lineage in one geographic area will look different than another area because of the accumulation of multiple mutations. 
One important question that has been much debated is whether the accumulation of mutations and divergence of viruses in different areas is creating clades which might have differential pathogenicity and or transmissibility. This could occur if the virus were mutating based on adaptive selection, perhaps for instance, to more easily bind to the ACE2 receptor or to develop another helpful skill, such as, in, such as improve the feasibility of transmission. While some authors have noted that the seemingly heavy favoring of certain mutations in certain areas is suggestive of the selective advantage, others have noted that one must take into account the founder effect. The founder effect says that if a new strain arrives in a particular area, mutations that it has will be overrepresented in the new area uh, that it is moving through. The founder effect is likely to be particularly profound for the spread of this virus. Aaron just discussed the concept of overdispersion, the idea that some individuals are responsible for a disproportionate amount of the secondary transmission of the virus, again, called super, these so-called super spreading events. If super spreading events contribute uh, to so much of the secondary transmission, mutations, found, uh, mutations in, these found, in the founding viruses that are spread in this way may have marked over representation in, in new areas in which they're spreading. You may have heard about the D614G mutation. Uh, this was discussed in a preprint by Korber and colleagues that was posted to BioArchive on April 30th. The authors set out to look at spike gene evolution from publicly available sequences from all over the world. D614G means that at the 614th position, there's an amino acid change from aspartic acid, which is represented by D, to glycine, which is represented by G. When the authors performed their analysis in early March, they found that seven out of 183 sequences available at the time had this, had this mutation for a rate of, for a frequency of about 4%. They note that over time, as more sequences were available, the, the fraction with this, with, this, uh, with this proportion increases dramatically to, to 56%. And they note that this, that this becomes the dominant strain in many regions. So as you can see uh, uh, from a selected uh, section from one of their slides, these, um, the, over time, in, in, even in areas which had the, uh, which had the, um, the, the, uh, the wild type virus, which is represented in orange, the, the green virus, the, 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 the blue virus, which is the D614G virus, is is increasing in in frequency as refer as as evidence as you go with with more time as you go to the right on the x-axis here there's more blue the authors propose several possible mechanisms why this mutation might have select uh, might have a selective advantage the first is that it may weaken the interaction between the s1 and s2 subunits by doing so it might allow for more rapid priming before cell entry they also suggest that the mutation might facilitate spike ACE2 binding. The authors also note that this site is an immunodominant region, and so changing the structure might have an immuno immunologic advantage for the virus. While these are provocative ideas, there's been significant criticism about the paper since they, since they did not take necessarily into account the important idea of the founder effect that we just talked about. Uh, so uh, again, others argue that Areas with, uh, with the wild type virus, for instance, might have had better control over the outbreak, whereas the D614G virus might have arrived at areas where it was more able to spread more rapidly uh, and that it's persisted because of the important founder, founder effect. The best analysis to date that we're aware of, uh, of whether two different viral lineages cause different clinical outcomes is from this picture in Nature. So these scientists reviewed the cases of 326 patients with COVID-19 in Shanghai. They had 112 different viral sequences from the cohort. They identified two, two major clades, which they called clade one and clade two. They then compared various factors from 78 individuals in clade one and 34 individuals who had clade two virus. Overall, they found no difference in the amount of critical illness or, the, or, or, the, or a variety of different um, laboratory parameters as, as shown in the table here on the right. In a thought-provoking preprint posted to MedArchive on May 26, researchers from Chicago analyzed the sequences of 88 SARS-CoV-2 genomes that were collected locally from patients who presented between March 14th and March 21st. 
They noted they clustered into three main clades, which they call clade one, clade two, and clade three. Again, these are different clades than what was just described earlier, and it's important to note there is not good or consistent nomenclature regarding these different lineages yet. Um, for their analysis, they included uh, 901 publicly available genomes from across the United States. They performed detailed statistical and phylogenetic analysis and found that clade one viruses uh, were most similar to those circulating in New York, um, uh, while clade three viruses were most similar to those cir circulating in Washington and the West Coast. Clade two viruses, on the other hand, were mostly from the Chicago area. And you can see here represented the various geographic distributions of clade one, clade two, and clade three viruses, where clade two seemed to be much more geographically restricted. Um, they, they do additional interesting analysis and show and suggest that uh, the clade two virus likely emerged around January 18th in Illinois. And they note that this fits with the first reported case of COVID-19 in Illinois, which was uh, in a woman who returned from Wuhan uh, on January 13th, so right around the same time. They found that while the highest proportions, uh, again, of clade one viruses remained in New York, uh, that this virus lineage had spread widely through, throughout, the, throughout the United States. They, they then uh, analyzed greater than 3,000 global sequences and found that clade two was really qu was quite restricted, not just in the US, but also internationally, and did seem to have originated in, in Wuhan. Next, they did something quite interesting. They compared the cycle threshold uh, of, the vi of, of the virus, of, of the clade two viruses to that of the clade one viruses and corrected for multiple comparators. They found that the clade one virus, uh, th th that overall the clade one um, cycle thresholds were lower, suggestive of a higher viral load because cycle threshold, uh, lower cycle threshold it indicates a higher viral load. So again, clade one viruses, lower cycle threshold or higher viral load as compared to clade two viruses. They then looked further at the at the clinical uh, uh, and illness course characteristics of patients with clade one and clade two viruses and did not find a difference there. So they wonder, wh while, while there doesn't seem to be a difference in the, in the uh, pathogenicity of clade one versus clade two viruses, they wonder if, uh, if a higher viral load seen in clade one might, might at least partially explain the, the um, the, the finding that it seems to be much more widely spread and, and, and it could be because it has higher transmissibility. It's a very interesting thought provoking hypothesis generating uh, thought. Other viral factors that you may have heard about as possibly influencing disease severity include inoculum or the amount of virus particles a susceptible individual is exposed to as well as the route of the exposure. There seems to be very little data available to date on these areas, but one interesting study is a preprint that was posted to BioArchive back on March 14th. In this study, the group, uh, the researchers inoculated rhesus macaques with SARS-CoV-2 through a standard intratracheal route, and then another group through a conjunctival route. Both developed some disease, although the animals that underwent the conjunctival inoculation had much less viral RNA in their lungs, which is shown here, where so blue are the are the this is this is the scale of where they're finding the virus. These are the conjunctival route, and this is the intratracheal route. This is the lungs, and you can see the intratracheal route uh, injected. Uh, it, the intratracheal inoculated macaques had much more much higher uh, viral RNA levels in their lungs, whereas the conjunctivally uh, inoculated macaques did not. Um, they also had much less severe pulmonary disease. Again, it's a provocative report that should be explored further. This is a summary slide of what we just reviewed. There's really many intriguing possibilities uh, for differential disease severity, including differential ACE2 expression, comorbidities, structural factors like racism and poverty, baseline host genetics, including HLA types and possibly ABO types, uh, uh, possible cross immunity, um, there, there is less evidence for viral factors like clade and inoculum at this time, although that, that, is, that is something to, to, um, to stay tuned to. Um, we want to go through three major studies related to immunity and vaccine that were published in the last week. On May 20th, two important papers on these topics were published in Science. 
So in the first study, nine adult rhesus macaques were inoculated with SARS-CoV-2 by intranasal and intratracheal routes. All animals developed high RNA loads in the lower respiratory tract and decreased appetite. In the top left figure, you can see the viral loads uh, in the lower respiratory tract uh, after, after inoculation. Um, so they then developed a special test that they called the e-gene subgenomic mRNA or sgmRNA test. And this allowed them to assess replication, to assess viral replication in host cells to distinguish it uh, from inoculated virus at the time of rechallenge. And the importance of this is what they do next. So, um, so actually, before they rechallenge the animals, they measure a strong adaptive immune response in all inoculated animals, uh, including, including the development of neutralizing antibodies. Then they rechallenged all nine animals on day 35, and they measured much lower levels of, of RNA. Um, when they, and, and, and the concern was because they were inoculating the animals again with, with virus, they want to make sure that the viral RNA that they're measuring is actually uh, replicating virus in host cells and not just the, R, the, the viral RNA from what they inoculated. And so they used, they used their special test and found, find even lower levels. Um, and so uh, they, they also could not recover uh, uh, replication competent virus from, from the animals after, after inoculation. They measure increased neutralizing antibody titers after the rechallenge, again suggestive of an effective adaptive immune response. Overall, this study was uh, was 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 uh, highly suggestive of of immunity after after infection. Uh, the same group looked at protection of rhesus macaques after they were vaccinated. They developed DNA vaccines expressing six variants of the S protein. They then vaccinated 35 macaques with with uh, with these vaccines. So um, they obviously the, the, this is the sham vaccine here, and then they had different uh, different um, the, the the six different DNA uh, S based vaccines here, and uh, and they were distributed among the 35 uh, monkeys. After vaccination, they measured neutralizing antibody titers in the in the animals. Interestingly, they found two of the animals had baseline neutralizing antibody titers, which they postulated might be from exposure to primate coronaviruses. At week six, which was three weeks after the vaccine booster, they inoculated the animals with SARS-CoV-2 by intranasal and intratracheal route, and they also inoculated the animals that had received the sham vaccine. The animals in the sham developed high peak uh, RNA loads and in the in the lower respiratory tract and the nasal um, and, and the nasal region, as you can see here with the sham, and the and the uh, and the um, inoculated and the, and the vaccinated animals develop significantly lower loads. So when they use that special test again, the SGM RNA test to measure just virus that was coming from inside host cells rather than virus that was part of the initial inoculum. They found, the reduction, they found a reduction in the peak viral load of greater than 3.1 and greater than 3.7 logs from the lower respiratory tract and the nose respectively for the vaccinated animals as compared with those who'd been given the, the sham vaccine. They measured strong adaptive immune response after vaccination and then in response and, and in response to the challenge. Both of these are incredibly important and exciting studies. Again, while rhesus macaques are clearly not humans and we need to wait for human data, the study suggests the likelihood of immunity following infection, as well as provide a scientific basis that makes the prospect of an effective vaccine seem, seem uh, closer and, and more likely. Um, on May 22nd, a group from China reported the first published human trial with uh, um, uh, with a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 in the Lancet. So they developed an adenovirus vector vaccine using a replication defective adenovirus serotype 5 that expressed SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. They then recruited 108 participants and gave them escalating doses of the vaccine by an intramuscular route. They took blood samples from the participants before and then on days 14 and 28. Besides injection pain, the most common reported systemic side effects were fever in 46% of patients, fatigue in 44%, and 
and headache in 39%. Um, they noted at least a fourfold increase in anti-RBD antibodies in the vast majority of the, co of the cohort, regardless of dose. Around half of the, core of the cohort had high baseline antibody titers to adeno adenovirus serotype 5, and this compromised seroconversion and adaptive immune response to the vaccination regardless of, of dose. In the figure here, you can see the reactive T cell response at baseline and then at day 14 and day 28 um, after each vaccine dose. So they break it up here by those without pre-existing adenovirus serotype uh, five uh, antibodies and those with high levels of antibodies. And what you can see is there's a less there's less response if you have high adenovirus serotype five um, antibodies. So this is also a critically important study since it's a proof of concept in humans. The authors note other strategies may be needed to achieve to achieve better immunogenicity, particularly for those with baseline. Uh, adenovirus uh, serotype 5 antibodies. It's also important to note while the individuals were shown to develop a robust humoral and cellular response after vaccination, it's not yet certain that they will be protective for SARS-CoV-2 infection, though it seems likely that it will be. Okay, so now to change gears a little bit, we're going to walk through some of the new studies highlighting some of the side effects of the global pandemic. Next slide. This letter of the New England Journal uh, on April 29th came from the Lombardy region of Italy, uh, one of the early epicenters outside of China. This group looked at out-of-hospital cardiac arrests in four provinces during the first 40 days of the outbreak, denoted uh, here in blue, and compared them to those in 2019, uh, denoted in orange, both corresponding to the right y-axis. COVID-19 cases are represented with the red line and correspond with the left y-axis. They found an increase from 229 cases in 2019 to 362 cases in 2020. The median arrival time to the emergency department was three minutes longer. The proportion receiving bystander CPR was 15.6 percentage points lower. And among those who had CPR, out-of-hospital death was 14.9 percentage points higher. Suspected or known uh, cases of COVID-19 accounted for only 77.4% of the increase in these out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. Next uh, slide. In the same vein, after anecdotal reports of people avoiding healthcare settings uh, for acute medical conditions that would otherwise be managed with hospitalization, we've now seen two letters to the Lincoln Journal about the incidence of hospitalization for acute MI. The first is published on April 28th from a group in Northern, uh, a group in Northern Italy and corresponds to the table on the upper left. They compared the outbreak period in Italy to two control periods, uh, the corresponding period during the prior year and an early period during the same year. I've included the part of the table looking at all uh, acute coronary syndromes. You can see in the first column, there were 2,202 total admissions. In the second column, there were 13.3 daily admissions during the study period compared to 18.0 daily admissions uh, during the same year, uh, same year control period. Uh, in the third column, and 18.9 uh, daily admissions during the previous year control group in the last column. This corresponds to a 26% reduction relative to the same year and a 30% reduction relative uh, to the prior year. The second letter of the Women's Journal was published on uh, May 19th from a group in California um, uh, using Kaiser data from 21 medical centers and 255 clinics caring for 4.4 uh, 4 million people. They compared weekly rates of hospitalizations for acute myocardial infarction in 2020 to, to, to those in 2019 and found an overall decreased incidence of 48%, with a decreased incidence of NSTEMI of uh, 49% and of STEMI of 40%. You can see in this figure in the top right where the x-axis is date and the y-axis is hospitalizations per 100,000. The yellow line is 2019, the red line is 2020, and the blue line uh, is the, is the COVID-19 cases. This is further supported by findings in, this, in a paper published in Jack in early April highlighted in the figure on the bottom left, which found a decrease uh, uh, in the total number of STEMI cath lab activations during the pandemic period highlighted in red on the figure. Together, this suggests that either acute myocardial infarctions are happening less frequently, or perhaps more likely that those with these conditions are avoiding care during the pandemic, possibly corresponding to the increase in out-of-hospital cardiac arrests we saw on the previous slide. Okay, so next slide. Uh, in this letter to the New England Journal published on May 8th, 
uh, investigators used a novel method to assess for changes in stroke evaluations. They used a commercial neuroimaging database typically used uh, uh, to select patients who would benefit from endovascular thrombectomy as a surrogate for the quantity of care hospitals are providing for patients with acute ischemic stroke. They looked at data from over 250,000 patients who had imaging at over 800 hospitals in the US from July 2019 through April, 2000, April 27, 2020. They compared mean daily uh, counts per hospital of patients uh, in a pre-pandemic period of February 1st to the 29th, highlighted in light blue on the figure, compared to a post-pandemic period of March 26th to April 8th, uh, highlighted in yellow on the figure. They found a 39% decrease in the number of patients undergoing imaging from 1.18 patients per day to 0.72. They also found an apparent increase after this initial low period, the mechanism of which is not yet well understood. They did not find regional differences in the decrease, uh, and the author suggests that this decrease in the use of stroke imaging corresponds to a decrease in the number of stroke evaluations uh, in the United States during that time period. Next slide. This report of child vaccination coverage in Michigan was published in the MMWR on May 22nd, comparing cohorts of between 9 and 10,000 children uh, in 2020 and each of the four years before that. They compared up-to-date status in May 2020 with May of the previous four years. You can see each of the age cohorts separated on the figure with the y-axis representing uh, percentage vaccinated, the black bar representing May 2020, and the blue bars representing prior years. They found that vaccination coverage declined uh, in all milestone age cohorts, as you can see in the figure, except for birth dose hepatitis B, all the way on the left, which is typically administered in the hospital. Importantly, they found a decrease in measles vaccination coverage from 76.1% to 70.9%. As you probably know, measles is a serious disease, but both direct and indirect complications. And measles outbreaks start to be seen even with relatively small decreases in vaccination coverage, with loss of herd immunity coverage uh, when, when vaccination coverage is less than about 90 to 95%. If this trend continues without vaccination catch up, we should expect, unfortunately, to see uh, increased measles incidence in the near to mid future. Next slide. This May 1st report from the Epic Health uh, Research Network used ICD coding from aggregated data, including 2.7 million uh, patients in 190 hospitals in the United States to evaluate trends uh, in cancer screening from 2017 through present. There was an overall slightly increased trend over time with increased variability at the end of each year around the holidays and following Breast Cancer Awareness uh, Month in October. The black dots in the figure represent weekly cancer screening volumes in 2020 uh, and over time. The top series is breast cancer screening, the middle is colon cancer, and the bottom is cervical cancer screening. The colored lines and bands are forecast trends, combining effects from prior years, seasons, and holidays. You can see towards the right of the screen the sharp drop-off in screening in 2020 represented by the black line. They found a 94% decrease in breast cancer screening, an 86% decrease in colon cancer screening, and a 94% decrease in cervical cancer screening. This should come as no surprise since the great majority of routine health maintenance visits and elective procedures have been deferred during the pandemic. And by the nature of these screening strategies probably will not have a meaningful long-term effect if we are able to make up for these missed tests in the not too distant future. That said, this is something we're gonna to need to follow uh, in the years ahead when lesions that would have been identified by these screening tests might start causing issues. Next, uh, next slide. So food insecurity is defined as the lack of stable access to food, uh, inadequate quantity or quality, and the state of food insecurity has been associated with many, many negative health consequences. This important preprint was posted in MedArchive on May 13th and describes a statewide population level survey in Vermont from March 29th to April 12th during the early epidemic in the United States. They used a validated six uh, question US Department of Agriculture food security module to measure food insecurity before COVID-19 and since COVID-19. They found that um, uh, among over 3,000 respondents, there was a 33% increase in household food insecurity, with 35.6% of food insecure households newly food insecure. In a multivariable analysis, they found that younger age, job loss, furlough, lost hours, female gender, having children, less than college educational attainment, and lower income were all independently associated with food security since COVID-19. This is in line with widespread concerns that an approaching global pandemic of hunger um, uh, may be following close on the heels of COVID-19 with substantial health consequences over both the short and long term. Next slide. 
In one bright spot, however, decreased energy demand has led to a dramatic reduction in CO2 emissions, as evaluated in this paper published in Nature Climate Change on May 19th. They defined a confinement index ranging from zero to three to capture the extent to which different policies affect emissions, uh, as shown in the table, with zero being no measures, one being measures targeted at small groups, two targeting entire cities or regions, affecting about 50% of society, and three uh, indicating national policies affecting all but essential workers. They used a combination of energy, activity, and policy data from areas representing 85% of the world population and 97% of global CO2 emission through the end of April 20, uh, 2020. In the figure on the right, you can see the change in activity by various sectors, from left to right power, uh, industry, surface transport, residential, and aviation. The largest change was in aviation, which had a decreased daily activity of 75%, with surface transport decreased by 50%, and industry decreased by 35%. As shown in the figure on the bottom left, they found then that the effect of confinement was to decrease daily global CO2 emissions by 17% by April 17th, relative to mean emissions in 2019, with emissions in early April now comparable to their levels in 2006. Uh, the total change in emissions through the end of April was a decrease of 8.6% over the same time period during the previous year. Finally, they make some rough predictions about the implications uh, for global CO2 emissions for the rest of the year, which will depend on the timing and degree to return, uh, return to normal activity. If everything returns to pre-pandemic activity levels within six weeks, the total decrease in emissions from the pandemic would be 4.2%. A 12-week return would be associated with a 5.3% decrease. A more modest return with all countries retaining restrictions at level one of their, uh, on their confinement index would be associated with a 7.5% decrease for the year. The authors note that most of these changes are likely to be temporary, uh, if not reflecting structural changes in our economic, transport, or energy systems, and that the social trauma of confinement may have unpredictable uh, consequences on emissions. Next slide. So here are some key points about the emerging side effects we are seeing from the pandemic, with collateral damage, including uh, increases in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and food security, food insecurity, and decreases in uh, hospital evaluations for ACS and strokes childhood uh, vaccination coverage and recommended cancer screening. The long-term consequences of some of these preventative interventions are currently unknown, particularly if we're able to catch up on some of them in the near future. Finally, decreased CO2 emissions is one small silver lining to this crisis. Next slide. And then just a summary uh, of the whole talk uh, for the last week, uh, we've seen data um, uh, including high quality randomized data, which brings us remdesivir as the first effective treatment for COVID-19. Uh, second, we have mounting evidence of high transmission heterogeneity and the importance of super spreading events. We uh, suggest that symptom or time-based strategies should be preferred for discontinuation of transmission-based precautions over test-based strategies. We uh, presented multiple intriguing theories for the severity spectrum, including host, societal, and uh, viral factors. We highlighted some impressive work um, uh, happening in, in vaccines uh, and also uh, work showing that there's a strong animal model, uh, animal model for immunity against reinfection. And finally, we went through some of the growing number of reports documenting the short-term collateral impact uh, of the pandemic. So all in all, just a, an incredible output of, uh, of information and um, an incredible amount of knowledge we've gained uh, just in, in, a, in a few days. So, um, with that, we'll close out and we'll see you next time.